Hello. Well, it's uh, 530, so Todd, we probably ought to let uh, Bob go. tell us his story. Okay. Are we on? Yeah, you're on, and uh, you have the floor. Hey. All right. Good uh, evening, everybody. Again, my name is Hai Kao, even though it's said as a Kao Tai Hai, but I go by Hai Kao in America. And it's, it is my honor to be here, and I'm humbling to tell you the story, my story from the day I left Vietnam until uh, I built my professional life in America. So uh, to start with, and then, you know, if you guys want to stop and ask questions, just go ahead and stop me, ask questions. You don't have to wait until I finish. Um, in 1975, before the April 30th, there was a lot of issue when, you know, the uh, Army of Republic of Vietnam withdrew from the north, started to withdraw all the way to really close to Saigon. And uh, the people, the atmosphere was very tense. But I was a 19 years old man and frankly, I was born in Saigon and grew up there, so I didn't really pay much attention, just like any teenager of politics or anything going on. So on the 29th of April, I was still going to, I still go to went to school uh, during the day, and then I when I came home, my parents uh, with a stone looking face and say, well get dinner and then get ready and uh, we need to leave. So basically I was shocked. They didn't tell me that, you know, that's what they were doing. So I and my two sisters, the older sister and the younger sister, we pretty much just have clothes on our, on our body and then left. So Basically, my dad, uh, now my dad, I'll just, this portion about my dad, he was by training, he was a, a captain of a ship. So he, he, uh, has very much, a lot of connection with the Navy ship captain of the Vietnamese Navy because he was one of them before he, uh, get out and work for the government, for the civil government. And uh, they talked to him that the the government momentarily will surrender, but do not know when. So he he loaded us onto his ship. His ship is real was really a government ship. On uh, Saigon River, if you were from Vietnam, you're in Saigon, you know, there's a Saigon River and uh, it, it, the ship parked there. So we came down to the ship. And when we came to the ship, there was already quite a few people. We did not know who get ready to get on that too. But because my dad was a captain, so he knew that uh, the lower deck will be terrible. So he told us to sit on, no matter what, sit on the upper deck. And uh, we will sit there and wait it, wait it, and then it go on to past midnight, and I think it's about one o'clock in the in the night, like the early, mor early morning of April 30th. Then uh, the news of the surrender, passed down, so that's when everybody, every captain of the ship lie up and left Vietnam on that Saigon River. Um, do you guys hear me okay? Uh, yeah, we hear you great. Okay. And uh, we were leaving 
at that time. After the surrender, then one by one, ship, all of the ship, mostly Navy. And my dad was one of the ship in there and lined up and then left. And as we were leaving Saigon on the Saigon River, there was shot as we come down to, if you know, Nyabea, you know, kind of a little bit out of Saigon into about to go to the ocean. And then shot start firing from the two sides, from the communists and from the Republic Vietnam, the Army of Republic Vietnam. But the ship kept sailing, kept sailing. My, my dad just kept going, keep going. And uh, we went like that. And it's just terrible because the room on the deck, well, we didn't have room to move. A lot of people, I mean, thousands of people. So we sat there and there's no food, nothing except uh, instant noodle that my mom just grabbed it and put it in his, her sack and then took on that. We have no clothes. And this, this part I'm going to tell you is gross, but bear with me. People who sit next to me and all that, they didn't have the, I mean, they got seasick. So they made that. And because we sit just, just so tight, it's all over. And then it rained. And then the sun come up and it dry. And we kind of like went through like that for almost a week. And we got to the civic base. Uh, the Navy base, uh, I believe it's under the U.S., but in the Philippines. Yeah, at that time, it was a U.S. Naval facility. Thank you. Yeah. But this portion uh, that make everybody crying and uh, my, uh, my personal experience until this day, 50 years later, I still remember that vividly. My dad got on the speaker and said that everybody need to get ready to salute our Vietnamese flag because he received the radio that he had to lower the flag in order to get it to the base. You cannot go there with the red, uh, I mean the yellow and three red stripe and go in there. So he performed the, like, you know, salute the national anthem and lower the, the flag and take it down. Uh, everybody cried. On the, on the ship. And uh, it, this is a side story. My dad valued that flag so much that when he died in 2009 in uh, Seattle, before he died, he said he wanted to put that flag, cover him in his gas cap. And uh, until now, I I still get emotion when I talk about it with my dad. Um, my dad, the way I look at him, he was a very strong man. Uh, you know, like commander of the ship, 5,000 people that he didn't know. And he made some decision uh, that amazingly, there was one old older lady, for some reason, get died. And uh, people asked him what to do. He said, throw it in the ocean. Can you imagine saying that to the family member? And so he explained to them, he said, I had no choice. I got this many people. And the only way if I bury in the sea, that's another thing. And then a lot of things he did that gave me the respect for his commanding, for his leadership. And uh, when we came to 
the civic base. When we get out of the ship, get into the base, the first thing they ran is they ran to the computer system. And they look at my dad and they say, you're supposed to be here 10 days ago. And that's true. My dad was on the list to be evacuated by the U.S. Embassy. But he refused to go because 10 days ago, there's really nothing to uh, warrant him to leave Vietnam. So they left. They quickly uh, got up, get us on the on the bus to uh, get on the I think C one thirty to go to Guam. But before that portion, when I get to the Subic base, my body with with all kind of dirty. I told you so. I need a a, a shower. And need to change clothes. So they have a bunch of old old clothes and you go select which one that fit you. And then here's here another thing. We went to like, you know, a public uh shower. The the Philippine guy have a hose. And it's up to you. You can take off your clothes or wear your clothes, but he just spray, male or female. And that's how you get uh, a shower. And then we, when we done with that, we we'll get a new clothes, new clothes to us, but it's clothes from from the from the navy, whenever the people donated. And then we went to Guam, and that started a good life right there, because when we were arrived at Guam, we were family house in the old town. And it's nice, and then it start having good food and all that. And then, in like two days, uh, we were on the another plan. This Sunday on the Boeing, I think, transport us all the way to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. That's a refugee camp set up to uh, for the Vietnamese refugee to arrive. That's in Arkansas, and. Uh, when we came there, we sleep, live in a barrack for, well, you know, because of the uh, military barrack in the Fort Chaffee. So we stay in the barrack and uh, the normal process is you stay there until somebody, until you find a sponsor or somebody agreed to sponsor you and then you get out. My uncle live in Seattle. My uncle is my my dad oldest brother. He had he had lived in Seattle way before that. He had lived in Seattle since 1963. He used to work for President Jim, and after President Jim was killed, he stayed back in the uh, U.S. as a working some sort of for uh, United Nations. But he sponsored us before the actual uh, collapse of Vietnam. So when we arrived at the refugee camp for Chaffee, he he told the the uh, the officer there and they searched and they notified my uncle and in a couple of days my uncle came over and they released us to my uncle. So at that time, we were so happy because we just, like, you know, uh, the, the journey from Vietnam to to Seattle was really fast. We arrived in Seattle on uh, June 3rd, uh, 1975. So that's a record fast. When we arrived in, in, in uh, Seattle, there was nobody there. Not yet. They're still in the refugee camp being processed. Um, so the minute I arrived in Seattle, my dad and my uncle <clears throat> uh, belonged to a Catholic parish. So he took us there to introduce us to the pe the parish and the people in there. And there was one 
lady. Her name is Laurie. And she was an English teacher in high school. So uh, she agreed, she kind of volunteered to uh, be like um, a teacher, a mentor for us in English. So every day I start learning English from Laurie. But uh, <clears throat> Because we were not refugee, we were not classified as refugee, but we were classified as a uh, family immigrant, uh, uh, family sponsored family. So we had to find job. So Laurie, the uh, English teacher, looked for us, for me, in uh, a school. Community, community, community college, a uh, job as a janitor, working on graveyard ship from eleven to seven o'clock in the morning. So a week after I got to Seattle, I got that job. So I worked there, but I forgot to tell you when, when I left Vietnam, I was a sec a sophomore of law school in University of Saigon back then. But when when uh, Laurie found me a job and I started there and then I learned English and then I want to go back to school to yet continue on with my uh, uh, education. So uh, I took the test uh, called TOEFL test that the English test for non-English speaking students. And I passed that. So in 1976, so I arrived in 1975, 1976, I started my school as a freshman at the University of Washington. And then I studied mechanical engineer. And after four years in 1980, I graduated from University of Washington. I went to work for Joe Electric Company in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, making, they call, they have a major appliance business. They have a big major appliance that build refrigerator, build all kind of appliance in, in the house, house appliance. I worked there and then uh, at night, I go to. I went to school for my master's degree, and uh, after a year, they transferred me to San Jose to work for the nuclear division. So I continue with my master's degree. So I got my uh, master's degree in system engineering at San Jose State University, and then I continue on. No more, no more education after that, and continue on with uh, working for GE and led on with Harris and on and on, and ended up working for Aerojet, uh, first as a project engineer and led on as a senior program manager and all the way to, I stayed with that company and, until I become like a member executive staff to be all the way up. And then I retired from that company in uh, 2021 and uh, uh, decided to go into politics in 2022. <laughs> and uh, that's my escape or my journey from Vietnam to America um, in a in a synopsis, in a short summary. Any, uh, any question from you guys that uh, you want to raise? Well, hi, I'm, I'm just pleased that you didn't have to spend that much time in a refugee camp. I'd heard reports about people wound up at Fort Chaffee for a very long period of time uh, <clears throat> before they could move on. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you didn't have to spend too much time at Subic Bay and got moved on to uh, 
to Guam. In fact, the squadron, our wing that was at Clark airlifted uh, people from both Subic Bay out of Cubic Point was the airfield there and out of Clark to, to Guam. And then you uh -huh. and, uh, went from there, uh, contract uh, air to the, uh, to the States. And uh, <clears throat> it was a little more livable. They were putting 140 people in the back instead of over 200. So you had a little bit more room to move. But, uh, you know, it wasn't like what you flew from, from Guam to the States. But I'm glad you had a family already here that you didn't have to spend too much time at Fort Chaffee. Did, did, did I say it? <clears throat> did I remember correctly, Ben? Because I think it's a C-130. Yeah, C-130s. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I remember I left uh, Subic Base in C-130. Yeah. Uh, Right. Well, yeah, there were a lot of people in uh, they had camps for refugees, both on Clark and uh, down at Subic Bay. And, uh, you know, the people were airlifted from there to Guam by the by the military. And then after that, they went uh, flew contract. Yeah, Rick Hayes question, uh, Ben. Hi, have you remained in contact with Laurie? Contract with who, Rick? Laurie. You're Laurie? Oh, Laurie? Yes. My, my English teacher, unfortunately, she passed away in 2012. Oh. She was, uh, she was close with my family. She and her husband were both out, was a Navy officer. I did not remember what rank he was. But at the time we arrived in Seattle, he was still active in the Navy. And I, unfortunately, I still don't remember whether he was in Vietnam or not, but they were like an angel. They were really, uh, really, really took care of us, both of them. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I have to believe that. I'm sorry, but I say this: if it offend you, then I'm sorry. But I really believe in the plan of God. My mom she taught me that too, because you know you could you, you cannot believe how we could survive from the trip from. Uh, Saigon River to the Subic Base. And and my mom, my parents always think that, always taught us that there's a plan from the men up there. So you just have to uh, follow the plan. Probably right. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and I see that too because my uncle went to the same parish with Al and Laurie, but they were not like buddy buddy or friend or anything. But it turned out that Al and Laurie were helping us like a family member. That's great. And and uh, if you don't have any question, I want to move from a different aspect of my life. I, uh, everybody, when I first came, everybody told me that, you know, uh, you have to work hard, especially when I finished from college. Oh, speaking of, speaking of college, I'm going to share with you with my unique experience in college at the University of Washington. I was junior year, and I took the class called thermodynamics. And uh, not not really long in the junior, it just I finished sophomore going to the, the junior year, and the first quarter I took thermodynamics class. So uh, the thermodynamics class is usually it's like, you know, lab work and calculation. So the final exam, uh, I did on the calculation. I did the experiment in the lab, 
I did taking data, everything correct, calculation correct. But when I know it's correct, but when I get the result, I saw a big F. And my lab report that the word that what you write you you wrote about the experiment. I mean red, correct everywhere. So when I received that I walk into uh the uh professor office house. His name I still remember today is Paul de Poo. He was a French guy. He uh I I I have I make an appointment on his office out and going there and I miss Professor De Poo. Uh, my calculation is correct, but you gave me an F. You fail me, and you know those are grammars and spelling and all of those. Are, and he looked at me. You know back then in the. 80 that you still allowed to smoke. I still remember he get sit back on his chair and he have his uh, pipe. Young man, when you graduate from this, you go to apply for a job. Did you will you tell your company that? Oh, because I say I'm Vietnamese. I just got here. I didn't learn English very well. So give me kind of cut me some slack. So he say, when you graduate, you go apply for a job, will you tell your employer that give you half, only pay you half salary because you're Vietnamese? And I didn't finish, I didn't even, I was, you know, shocked I didn't answer. And he said, get out of my office. <laughs> I was so angry, upset, but I made my de decision at that moment. I, I determined I will prove to him my capability. So when the time to re-register the course, I registered with the same professor. And I went to work with my English lorry, my English mentor, and, and helped me. And I said, I want to uh you know prove with this professor that i'm going to get a you know at least a b but my goal is an a a perfect so help me laurie she said okay so every day she trained me on english so <laughs> the next one the next the second quarter that i got every classmate of mine said you stupid hi why did you go back to? There are so many other professors. Why go back to that guy? Every one of them say he's a racist. Why you go back to there? I said, I don't care. I want to prove to him I can do it. Okay. So I went back to him and he looked at me in the first day of the class. He looked at me like, <laughs> oh, you still want to show up here? In the end, I got like, you know, 4.0 4. is maximum. I got the final exam on that class, it's like 3.8. So he called, into, he called me into my head's office and said, he really gave me a compliment and say, uh, explain to him why did I do that? I say, it's very simple. I just want to tell you, like you, like the, the English saying, when there's a will, there's a way. I want to prove to you I can do it. That's it. I'm, I, I, I don't run away from, from uh, failure. He became my best reference professor when I applied for GE. I give him a, a reference. He wrote in the reference letter that this guy will not say no. So that's a, that's a story. But the reason I share that story, because years later, even he told me that back in like, you know, uh, before he retired, I think in the late 90, about 99, 2000, I uh, went back for his uh, retirement party. He remembered that. He said, if I said, 
to another student student now, I probably got executed. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, no. I took it as a, a good motivation. So that's a, a little side story I want to share. Yeah, that's a great story. And 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 by the way, I kept telling my children when they growing up that just have to do your best and don't think that um, don't keep thinking that you don't get what you want because you are being discriminated. You may not get what you want, not because you are being discriminated, but because you are not good enough. And they said, so that, one of my my sons said that, so you don't think that they're discriminating, discriminating us? I said, I don't, I do not say that they don't. But I'm telling you, you have to go beyond that and make them that they cannot do it because you're so good. So I told them, I said, don't think that Aerojet hired me the only one in the senior management because they just want to be uh, complying with uh, eco uh, opportunity and all that. If I don't make money for Aerojet, they don't hire me for a minute. And the same thing that if I'm as good as a Caucasian, they hire a great Caucasian. Why the hell do I have to hire a Vietnamese who speak English with an accent? So I have to be better than the Caucasian. That like they cannot afford not to hire me. That's how I teach my kids. Don't quickly think that you're being discriminated. And that I, I have lived all my life like that. That they can, they, 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 they hire me because of my contribution, not because of my, <laughs> of my skin color. That's great. Hi. That, um, I'm glad you have that attitude. I wish more people uh, did. Uh, it'd be a lot healthier. Uh, you, you were telling me earlier, if we talked for the program about you, you're making some plans for 2025, which would be 50 years since you left Vietnam. Would you like to share something with us about that? Oh, yes. Thank you, Ben. Um, earlier this year, I was invited to the, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Texas Tech University. Uh, they have a, a they call Vietnam Center. So they did the commemoration of the Paris Accord, 1973, because 1973, to 2023. So they uh, told me that they want to do something for the uh, 50 years of the Vietnamese refugee arrived to the US. So that means 75 to 2025. So I have been thinking about looking for the successful Vietnamese uh, refugee who came here and successfully reestablished themselves in this society. And uh, by talking with Ben, Ben mentioned uh, earlier there's a, a Vietnamese doctor that came here and were able to restore his doctor career and there's another pilot so I'm and was able to do the same thing so I'm thinking that not only those but so many successful story uh, that we can just light up but particularly those veteran in the in in the world from uh, from the Vietnamese uh, army, from the Army of Republic of Vietnam, and if they were successful here, I'm not talking about those who grew up here. I'm talking about those that came from Vietnam and uh, became successful here with their career. 
and we can just make a program together and uh we'll go to uh we go to put on a show i mean not a show like a presentation <laughs> that would be good yeah that'd be great yeah the uh physician that i was telling you about he was actually a surgeon in vietnam he became a anesthesiologist here uh and the pilot i was talking about uh Todd, they, they're part of the Vietnamese community here in the Pittsburgh area. Todd may be able to, to contact some of those people. Um, so that, that'd that be good. There were a number, number of people there who have been very active in, uh, you know, the workforce and, and uh, culture here in the Pittsburgh area. And I would think that you would have the same in uh, the Atlanta area where you are. Uh, actually not, Ben, because the, the people who were here, I've been, I've been here for 10 years in Atlanta, about nine and a half years, almost 10 years. Uh, they were, for some reason, they were not, um, there were one famous guy here. Uh, he was like in a special force. He works for, he was like a contract for uh, the U.S. special force. And uh, he was captured by the, the by uh, Hanoi. Oh, you know, very early. And then he didn't, they didn't even release him until way past 75. So he spent like, Two to years in in the prison in in Hanoi. <laughs> oh my! But he survived. But he he was not like restoring his uh, his because he really uh, by the time he got here he he's too old to and he didn't really have a a, a special professional career like the physician or on the pilot or he just was like a special special force. And, and which university is hosting that? Uh, Texas Tech. Texas university. Tech in Lubbock? Yeah. In Baltimore. Okay. In Bullock. Texas Tech University. Yeah, Texas Tech University. It's in Lubbock, Texas. Yeah. That they have they have uh they call Vietnam Center. They yes. want to. They want to establish themselves, like you know, the 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 deposit depositor of all of the Vietnam War history and documents and all of that. Yeah, we've had uh, some folks there uh, on the BBC program before. <clears throat> yeah, they're good people, and uh, recently. There's another organization I've been in communication with that had done a lot of mission trips in Vietnam, pr predominantly medical mission trips. And uh, they chose to archive all their information with that Vietnam Center at Texas Tech. There is a new, a newer one um, they call Oregon University of Oregon. They also uh, doing uh, like a Texas Tech, they also create a, a Vietnam Center, but a, or or University University of Oregon. Yeah, they're in uh, Eugene, Oregon. That's right. That's right. Yeah, well, that's great. But well, anything else from your uh, becoming acclimated to being an American because you're an American now. Uh, as well as uh, a Vietnamese heritage that you'd like to share with us? They, I, uh, I'm i glad you mentioned that. I think the most I have observed even now for Vietnamese just arrived here uh, to the uh, Vietnamese American who grew up here, uh, the cultural difference. And also, I have observed a lot of parents, even parents who live, 
who came here a long time, but still struggling with uh, cultural difference, basically in Vietnamese culture, if you are the dad or a higher rank, you say something to the younger uh, son, kid, or student, you expect no uh, talk back. You say jump, jump. No question asked. You don't allow to ask. Parents are God. They had to be right, always right. And uh, the kid grew up here or was born here, they have that problem with like, there are so many Vietnamese family that the grandparents still live with the parents and they still with the grandkids. So when the grandkids talk to the grandparents, the grandparents still uh, have that mentality that if I say that you do, you don't talk back, don't question nothing. That has been the struggle in so many Vietnamese families. So I have been trying to explain to so many families that I am like a, the trans, I call myself a transitional generation. That yes, I was born in Vietnam, but most of three quarters of my life now is in America. Plus I, uh, I went to school here. I worked in American company. I adopted a lot of American uh, culture. So I explained to them that you just have to accept kid go to school, your grandkid go to school, now come back asking you the question. I have, I just recently have a, a situation that a friend of mine uh, kind of like complain about his daughter. I call her a friend, but he was younger than me. Uh, <clears throat> he came here not so long ago, but his daughter was born here. So his daughter went to school and she's about 12, 13 years old. So when uh, he and his wife disciplined the daughter, and they say, like, you know, I gave you, I, 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 I uh, like, I'm your parents. I gave birth to you. Mom said, I gave birth to you. So I have, I expect you to do this, do that. And the daughter said, I didn't ask to come to this life. You did. You brought me to life here. So don't tell me I have to do it because you gave birth to me. I didn't ask you to give birth to me. You did. <laughs> He was beyond himself. And his wife is also, so he called me up and said, how can I do it in this case? So now, uh, you know, we got a lot of social, the cultural difference between the two cultures. So I, just, I have to explain that. I say, you know, the kid went to school or kids go to school, they get that education you know, how baby was made and all that. So now you have to talk to them in a different way. You don't tell them. You don't keep telling them, I give birth to you. I have the right, I expect you to do this, do that. You have to pursue it. You know, he's struggling with that when I say that. I say, me? Our parents have to talk? Kind of like pursue the kid to do it? Well, that's... <laughs> the culture in this country. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I, it's changed here, too. 19th century, even early 20th century, uh, whatever the parents say, it went. Uh, but in, uh, you know, the last 7,500 years, uh, this respect for, for parents and respect for authority has diminished greatly in this country as well. And I, I agree, it's a, it's a struggle. Yeah, but a lot of Vietnamese parents, even though they are Vietnamese Americans now, they have not been able to adjust to that difference. And neither, and neither uh, to me, it's a bad habit. 
is that Vietnamese Americans, they don't value their votes. Um, a lot of them came here after uh, live with the communists for a long time. So they became, they got used to the communist system that it doesn't matter what you do. The communists will pick the, the uh, representative for you. So they, they vote, uh, people vote is useless. So they came here and when they come to election time, I tried to explain to them, you have, you have to go vote. Most of them say, uh, why wasting my time? Because I have to go to work. I don't just skip work. Most of them do the nail, nail thing, you know? So I, I'd rather make money than go vote. So I have to explain to them how important that is to go vote. But, you know, uh, that's, that's something I say people risk their life for the, for the right to vote. And you have the right, you came here and you got the right to vote and you, you don't exercise your, your right. Yeah, we had a recent example in the news here in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, there was a community for the uh, uh, borough council that one, two council members run against each other and had exactly the same number of votes. And so they wound up use, casting lots, basically, to decide who won. But if one more person had voted for either one of them, that one would have won. Yep. So, I, I mean, you know, that just illustrates why every vote counts. Yeah, I also, I also tried to explain that uh, the only, the other benefits that we do as a citizen, a go vote so that we can have the leverage, especially if you come from an ethnic group, that you can, you, you have to go vote. So they look at the vote and they say, okay, 2% Vietnamese American or 20% or whatever. So that becomes your leverage. You can you go talk to your candidate or your politician and, and uh, you carry some weight. Versus right now, 2%, and they look at 2%, and they say, why bother? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that you're uh, uh, upholding, you know, the need to, to be a responsible citizen and vote. It's very important. Yep. You know, irrelevant of where you are politically, it's important that uh, your your vote is cast. That's right. That's right. And, and that's because we live in this greatest country on earth, you know, you don't cast your vote, then. <laughs> Good. Anybody else have questions for High before we uh, press on? I appreciate High coming to tell his story. Uh, oh, uh, Rick? I just wanted to ask you, High, when, yeah, so, uh, when the convoy of the Vietnamese ships you were on was yes. leaving, was on the Saigon River, heading yes. to the ocean, you said they were it, they were fired on from both sides. Yes. Did the ships return fire? No. 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 Was anyone hurt? My ship, there was nobody hurt. Nobody hurt. Could. But on one ship, there was a man who was very famous in Vietnam, but we didn't know until we got to the U.S. because we didn't. No, I, I took it back. My dad talked to, to the other on the radio and and he knew that um, our ship didn't have anybody die, but they, on on the other ship there was, he was a, a newspaper publisher. His name is Chu Tử and he got hit and he died. And they had to do the uh, beauty in the sea, like uh, the uh, uh, old lady on my, on my, my dad's ship. Yeah. And how many ships were there? Do you know? I had to venture to say, like, most of the Navy ship, the not like a, the big, 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 big uh, plane ship, but most of the Navy were lined up to leave. 
the ship from the Vietnam Vietnamese Navy. So I don't know how many. Sorry, thank you. I think that they they return in those navy ships. They also have private commercial ships, but they're all light up. They kind of like mix with navy. Yeah. That had to be quite a sight. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you were on a big enough ship to go all the way to Subic Bay. That's a good trek right. from uh, <clears throat> Saigon to Subic Bay. <clears throat> My dad's ship was also not his ship. It's a government ship. Right. Because at the time that he was he was not he was no longer a captain for a long time because he left. He worked for he worked for Saigon Paul, Saigon Harbor. He was like, you know, director of Saigon Paul, you know, kind of like uh, his job was like, you know, get approval for what ship in and what ship we get out and when and all that. So he no he was no longer he was not a ship captain for quite some time. But surprisingly he still remember <laughs> I guess just like driving a car. You, you don't drive a car for a while but you still know how to drive a car. <laughs> well, that's great. Any other significant things from your story you want to share with us, huh? Uh, <clears throat> I just want to share another thing that the reason that I involved in politics. This is my intimate telling with you guys. Like when I was in Vietnam, born in Saigon, grow up, I was not. I didn't pay any attention to politics or anything. But I did uh, took a, a class called Political 101. And, and uh, the professor who taught that class, I met him again in Seattle when I came to Seattle, not met him in the USA. When he came to the USA, he worked for Harvard University. So then I found out that he was he was like a, a PhD for political science and he was working to reform restore democracy, not reform, but restore democracy in Vietnam. So he invited me to join his uh, party called Dai Viet Nationalist Party. But that that party had been in existing since 1939. And I had been in that party until now. And right now I'm a vice president of that political party, the Viet Nationalist Party. And the, the vision and the, the objective that is to bring uh, freedom of election, freedom of vote, uh, human rights, and democracy for people in Vietnam. And that's the sideline that I've been working until I retired. And I decided to go into the, the mainstream American politics and for me to have a chance to convince and lobby the American politics and the American uh, the political arena. Because a lot of people, even in different administration that they did not really understand how evil the Vietnamese Communist Party or for that matter, Chinese Communist Party are. I went like in May of this year, I went to the uh, State Department. I met very young political advisor, political think tank, 
in the uh, secret in the State Department, but they have no idea. Uh, they have no experience with communists. So by talking to them, I basically have to share with them and uh, tell them how devious the communists are. And that's the reason I want to pursue my political career to give me the chance to have a platform to talk to American government and help preserve this country because I do not want this country to fail apart. Yeah. Well, I hope uh, that you and your organization succeed in bringing democracy to Vietnam. It'd be wonderful. I shared with you about the lady we met at the DMZ. Rick uh, Erisman is on here, and he probably heard her too. Uh, she and her husband had met us there at the DMZ. And I don't know exactly what they did in Saigon. I kind of got the impression they were in some sort of a a business uh, endeavor there and were visiting. And, and she told us, well, you come back in 10 years and the communists will be gone uh, because we're going to own the place. And, uh, you know, my feeling is I hope you're right with your entrepreneurship that you have, that uh, whether if you do it economically, politically, or however you do it, uh, that if you can bring uh, democracy and, and freedom and liberty uh, to the people in Vietnam, that would be absolutely wonderful. They were so they were so thrilled to meet those six Vietnam veterans. Uh, they were overwhelmed with the contact they had. They were so thankful for us having been there. What language did they talk to you, Rick and Ben? I I don't know what their what their names were. No, no. Uh, the How the woman's they... pictures on uh, three, four oh. issues ago of the yeah, she's Veterans Breakfast Club magazine. Of the VBC magazine about two two issues ago. My question is how do they how did she communicate with you? In English or in, in English? Oh yes. yeah, definitely. Oh yeah. She spoke very good English. Very good. <laughs> very good English? Oh yes. yeah. We thought. <laughs> wow. Well I I I she may be optimistic. Oh, I'm optimistic. I mean, they're they're hard. Well, as you well know, they're hardworking people with a strong work ethic, and uh, uh, very industrious, uh, very smart. And uh, the only thing holding them back is a very corrupt communist government. So I hope you succeed. Well, I, I hope so too. But uh, you know, it's not an easy, not a, like you know, walking, uh, walking water. Or, I mean, no. it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it's that last week, last week they were. Uh, you guys were uh, aware that last week there there was uh, APEC, Asia Pacific Economic right. in San Francisco. In San Francisco, and the. President of Vietnam, Võ Văn Thường, attended together with uh, Xi Jinping from China. And uh, what happened was in Vietnam, see, the, the APEC meeting started on last Wednesday on the 15th of November. On the 14th, the uh, police, uh, similar to the FBI here, arrested one of their superstar uh, representative. Their representative already were handpicked by the Communist Party. But this guy, his name is Lu Bình Nhung. He was a different, different animal. He had a PhD in law. I don't know if it's in Vietnam or Russia or somewhere, but he's a college professor, he's a professor of law school in Vietnam. At the same time, he was a member of the uh, Congress of the Communists there. And he constantly uh, criticized the government, uh, the Communist Party, the Vietnamese Communist Party. And he confronted the head of the so-called uh, police state, police department, 
big police, um, central police, and they arrested him the day before. That. <laughs> not not freedom of speech or freedom of expression. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's, that's my point. And that anybody who who dare to speak against them, arrest. Yeah. So there, there's no freedom there. If you if you uh, go there, if you live there and you don't say anything and you just enjoy life and don't even mention to to uh, uh, government or anything, then it's okay. I have a show on YouTube with a host. Her name is Rachel Lay, and. If I say, if I go on her show, if I say something, that's on YouTube. But uh, if I say something offended to the communist government, they told Google, YouTube, to suspend her account. Like, you know, a warning for two days, repeat it a week, or all right. So they listen to everything, even here. Oh, yes. Well, when we went to Vietnam, and, and, and Rick and I both knew that, you know, you get on the Wi-Fi in the hotel or any communication that you made in Vietnam, just assume you're being monitored. Uh, I mean, that's just the way it is. So don't say or write anything that uh, uh, you you don't want anybody else to know. <laughs> so it's a sad, sad, sad world when, it, when you don't have freedom of expression. you got people... Uh, you know, basically spying on you. Don't yeah. Take, don't take pictures at the Ho Chi Minh Mausoleum. <laughs> we almost got a guy. <laughs> he was taking photos, uh, you know, in Hanoi at that <laughs> mausoleum that they have for Ho Chi Minh. Yeah. They wanted to confiscate his camera and, oh, my. Yeah, big time. <laughs> why, why, what, what's the reason, Rick and Ben? What the reason they do not allow to take picture of? They, they prohibit it. For whatever reason, was there a sign, or we didn't see it? Well, you know, our guard guy had said, "Don't take any pictures there." But <laughs> he was he was taking some. But our guide managed to talk to him and talk him out of it because he didn't want to lose. He would have lost all the video footage this that he had all, done up to this that point. Part time. of a part of a documentary, so that's why he did it. Yeah, but uh, yeah. But any rate, yeah, they they uh, were they didn't want you to take any photos there for whatever reason. So it, it's the old thing. You don't have freedom of action either. <laughs> and in uh, in that country, even as we speak right now, the corruption is terrible. Yes, I don't know if you heard about that, but I had never been there, but. Uh, my oldest son, I got four kids. Every one of them went back to Vietnam. All my four kids went back to Vietnam. And my oldest son went back with uh, an American friend. That was like 10 years ago. And they, uh, when they, on his way in, they asked for money. And my son Say I don't have any money. And they they say you don't have money. He said no. I, I use credit card. I don't have cash. So they just say then go. And on his way out, exit Vietnam. They ask again, and uh, he, he again he say I don't have it. They didn't do anything to him, but they did ask. They ask not very explicitly, but do they have any gift for me? <laughs> yeah, otherwise known as a bribe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the corruption's awful. But it, it, interestingly, he went with a Caucasian friend, American. They did not ask, his name is Paul. He did, they did not ask him. Yeah. Because my son understands Vietnamese. So they asked my son in Vietnamese. And then uh, the second time, he, like a, one or two years later, he came back again with a different American uh, friend. 
and they did not ask that. And then when the third time, I think it just last year, he went back a bigger by there. By last year, he was a big shot with T-Mobile. So he, he came back there. He told me he came back here. He told me, he said, Dad, they do tend me like a king. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so to, oh. My, to my kids, there's nothing on the surface, uh, like, you know, material life in Vietnam. My son, all my four kids say their life in 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 uh, in Vietnam is no different than America. Every single young person has a cell phone and blue jean, and their life is just like American life. They don't see the like you know the side of being a poor country. Yeah, well, it's very different uh, from when we went in twenty eighteen. Uh, they're much more affluent than people are in the South, uh, even though there's still a lot of poverty in the South uh, than in the North. So that tells you the difference is the, the level of affluence between the two. So 2018 is very recent, only five years ago. Right. So it's still visible, the difference between North and South. Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah, I hope before I die, I got a chance to go back. Well, I hope <laughs> you do, too. And uh, hopefully it'll work out for you where you can, can do that safely. I uh, hope so. Because there has been a lot of healing there. I mean, I was uh, pleased to see how, how far the people there have come, but it's industrious and as smart as the people are, uh, on the other hand, I wasn't surprised, but uh, they they need the freedom. That's what they need. But did you, uh, you guys, when you were there in 2018, have you came in contact with any police guy or official no. government or anybody? No, that really didn't want any, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> not, not. Not as such. Other than that one encounter at uh, Ho Chi Minh's mausoleum, uh, when the guy with that did a video a documentary, uh, you know, was our only only such contact. So the the gentleman who wants to do the video is he on your on your group on your team or he's a different group? Yeah, no, he went with us, and uh, in fact, he. He did a documentary. It's shown on the local PBS station, and you can actually buy the documentary now on uh, uh, from Amazon. It's on Blu-ray, oh, DVD. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. It's called "We Left His Brothers," or if you go onto Amazon, yeah, uh, and uh, just put in their search window "We Left His Brothers," and it'll come up, and you can watch it for three dollars you know, on uh, on Amazon Video, or you uh -huh. can buy the DVD for, I think it's $25, something like that. I see. But you can watch it uh, on there for like $3 to watch it one time. Ah, uh, okay. And that, that young lady at the bridge at the DMZ is on there too. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. And also the North Vietnamese uh, guide, that was a soldier met Andy, a wounded yeah. Vietnam veteran, and they, yeah. they met and embraced. The the other the Vietnamese also was a veteran. Oh yeah. yes, oh he had his war wounds too, because he, he looked at at the guy that was with us, you know, who was uh, seriously wounded in Vietnam. So he's uh, got a lot of scars on his face as a result, and. Uh, the That's, man comes up to him and they, you know, he couldn't speak English, but he knew a little bit and he said war and points to it. And then he pulled up his pants leg and showed where he had a wound, you know, the scar. And that's uh, in, the, in the documentary. Yeah. And then, you know, they just embraced each other. They were two soldiers, you know, doing what they were, were called to do, but uh, by different, different governments, but uh, everything was fine between the two of them. It was uh, a very touching scene. 
you know, because this man had been in the North Vietnamese Army. He was a North Vietnamese regular. Mm. He 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 is not the the uh, called National Liberation Front soldier. No, he no, was, he was he was uh, a Vietnamese regular from he the north. He was a Vietnamese regular from the north. Okay, right, yeah. Well, hi, thank you so much for sharing. Anybody else have any questions before we sign off? Todd, you got any questions? He's packing. He's packing, getting ready to go on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> have a safe trip, Harry. <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully he'll uh, he'll come up because I need to get him to transfer host back to me so we can sign out. <laughs> and he can stop the, the YouTube. But I think I can sign out from here. Well, good. Well, thank you. Hi, I appreciate it. And uh, hey, it's, it's, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to tell my story with uh, the war hero, you guys. Well, good. Well, we're not war heroes, but uh, 